Tonight's presentation is titled TBO 5000. Remarkable number when it comes to a TBO, eh? Our presenter is Mike Bush. Mike is president of Savvy Aviation Incorporated. He's a author for numerous aviation publications over many years, has a certified flight instructor certificate and A&P mechanic certificate with inspection authorization privilege. And in 2008 was the Aviation Maintenance Technician of the Year in the FAA and also a member of EAA. Mike, thank you so much for being with us tonight and sharing this remarkable information. I'm kind of intrigued to hear all about this. I'm gonna turn control the presentation over to you. Okay, uh, Tim, and good evening, everybody. Um, yep, 5,000 is a nice round number. <clears throat> And uh, there's an interesting story behind it. Um, so uh, this story, uh, it's a long story, so I'm gonna try to go through it as quickly as possible. It started uh, 11 years ago in uh, 2011. Um, <clears throat> and it had to do with a, uh, an airplane belonging to a flying club, which, uh, for the purposes of this webinar, I will call unruly flyers. That's not the real name, but. Um, and uh, <clears throat> the board of directors of unruly was facing a problem back in 2011. It's a 14 member Midwest flying club. Um, and the 14 members share a single aircraft, a 1997 Cessna 172R, which had been upgraded. <clears throat> with a uh, Lycoming IO360 engine that was rapidly approaching its 2000 hour TBO. Uh, so the board um, was trying to decide what to do. Um, they considered um, sending the uh, engine out for a field overhaul, which um, would put the, uh, the club on the ground uh, for at least three months because they only do have this one airplane. Um, they also considered replacing it with a Lycoming rebuilt engine <clears throat> that they thought might shorten the downtime a little bit, but uh, would increase the cost. And uh, so in the course of trying to decide what to do, they um, reached out to a fellow by the name of Whit Whittington, He's a member of the club and had um, previously been the club's maintenance officer for many years. Um, and they, because uh, they were facing a pretty serious maintenance decision, asked uh, Whit whether he would come out of retirement and uh, uh, retake uh, the uh, position of uh, maintenance officer for the for the club and help steer them uh, through this decision making. Whit was an A and P, but but he'd been flying general aviation aircraft for more than two decades, and in his tenure as uh, maintenance officer of the club, he had proven himself to be exceptionally maintenance savvy. So Wood agreed to resume his um, former role as maintenance officer. <clears throat> and at the next um, board meeting of the flying club, he started uh, asking the board um, what I think were all the right questions. He said, well, are we having problems with this engine? And the answer was no, not that we know of. So why are we thinking about overhauling or replacing it? Well, because it's almost a TBO. Well, are we required to do something when it reaches TBO? Well, I, I guess not. We, we, we operate under part 91, so we're not really required to do anything. So why not just continue it in service? And the question is, well, for how much longer can we do that? Well, how about continuing in service until there's some indication that we ought to take it out of service, so that, that, that overhaul is needed? So there was a lot of um, mumbling on the board about, is this safe? And how, how would we des decide when it's time to overhaul it if we decide not to do it at TBO? Um, <clears throat> uh, what explained to the board that some years uh, earlier, he had attended a workshop that I'd conducted where I tried to make the case for doing maintenance on condition rather than on the fixed timetable that the manufacturers uh, recommend. And I generally 
advise doing on condition maintenance for everything, not just engines. Um, and I've talked about that a lot in previous webinars. And during this workshop that Witt attended, I <clears throat> presented the results of a five-year study of general aviation engine failure accidents um, based on NTSB, on uh, data from the NTSB database, which demonstrated pretty clearly that the greatest risk of an engine failure accident occurs when the engine is young, not when it's old. Um, I've, I've used these slides in previous webinars, but and you may have seen them before. But um, this is a, these are a couple of histograms that that uh, that we created um, based on analysis of uh, five years of general aviation uh, accident data from the NTSB, where we looked at all of the accidents that the NTSB attributed to uh, engine failure being the probable cause or a contributing factor to the accident. These were bona fide engine failures, not things like running out of fuel. Um, and the left one uh, is um, uh, how many accidents occurred uh, based on how on hours on the engine since the engine was built, rebuilt, or overhauled. And the right histogram is based on calendar time, and how many years elapsed uh, since the engine was built, rebuilt, or overhauled. And without getting too far into the weeds, when you look at this, it's pretty clear that um, engines have a significant infant mortality risk when right after they have been built. Um, and um, so it was pretty clear from the data that if you're going to fall out of the sky because of an engine failure accident, the most likely time to do it, that you're gonna do that, is uh, when the engine is young, uh, not when it's old. And so what says to the board, you know, we really should be worrying more about engine failure during the first 200 hours after the engine is overhauled or rebuilt uh, than worrying about engine failures the first 200 hours after it goes past TBO. Um, because he was recommending um, continuing the engine in service based on condition, he also recommended to the board that they um, that they enroll the the Skyhawk in my company's uh, Savvy MX managed maintenance program, um, so that we could help them uh, with their condition monitoring and help advise them um, uh, what work should be done on the engine and when when the appropriate time would be to uh, to take it out of service. And the board agreed to do that. Um, so uh, when they enrolled the aircraft, we, we assigned um, one of our most experienced account managers named Eric Svelmo, an ANPIA of um, probably 30 years experience, um, to, to work with WIT um, on the maintenance of, uh, of the club Skyhawk. Um, I, I selected Eric for this job uh, because not only is he a very experienced a and PIA, but uh, he's got a lot of experience um, doing uh, like homing engine overhauls. And he spent quite a bit of time working in overhaul shops and so on. So he knows these engines inside and out. And he knows what their weak points are and their strong points and so on. And I thought he would be an ideal person to, to help advise Wit and the uh, and the flying club on what to do with this engine. So this is 2011, 11 years ago, and, and the journey began. Um, uh, Eric started off asking with a bunch of background information about uh, the airplane and, and its use and so on. And he learned that the, uh, that the, the club was, uh, was averaging 300 hours a year on this airplane. That, and then it, in some previous years, it had flown as much as 600 hours a year. So it was um, a busy airplane. This is 14 people sharing one Skyhawk. So they kept it pretty busy, which is a good thing. Um, they had originally acquired the airplane in 1998 uh, when it had 500 hours since new. And they had upgraded the engines uh, using an airplane's STC to upgrade the, um, the horsepower from 160 to 180 horsepower. The plane was hangared at uh, an airport that I will call Midwest Regional Airport um, in the Midwest United States, and it was maintained by the local FBO, 
uh, at that airport, which I will refer to as Midwest Air. Um, Whit felt that Midwest Air had done a decent job um, uh, on maintenance. The, he thought they were maybe a little bit weak in troubleshooting, and he was a little bit concerned that there were, had been some recent uh, personnel turnover in the shop that uh, that, that had, him, had him a bit concerned. But he basically briefed uh, Eric on the situation. And he told Eric that the club's primary concern at this point was that the, uh, that the engine, uh, which had been a Lycoming factory rebuilt, um, had uh, over 2,000 hours. And um, for Unruly to continue flying it, they were going to have to put it on a really good condition monitoring program so that they could decide uh, when when it was time to uh, uh, to, to stop flying it and, and, and have it overhauled or replaced with another uh, factory rebuilt. Um, in the course of the conversation, um, uh, Eric indicated that we put a lot of uh, faith on in, in on bore scope inspections and that that's a very important tool that we use in order to determine engine condition and uh Witt told uh, eric that midwest air wasn't much of a believer in bore scopes they he said they have an old clunky one that they hardly ever use so we really don't know what our exhaust valves look like or our cylinder barrels look like and uh, eric said that, that we we're gonna have to we we're gonna have to do something about that um, he explained to Witt that the, these four-cylinder Lycoming engines are about as close to bulletproof as, as uh, airplane uh, aircraft engines get, um, but they do have a few vulnerabilities uh, that need to be monitored closely when, uh, when the engines are operated at, at real high time. One area of concern was the the exhaust valves. Uh, Lycoming engines use sodium-filled exhaust valves. They have a hollow stem with, with liquid sodium inside, and they have a history of of um, becoming eroded and pitted, uh, and are vulnerable to breakage um, after a, a few thousand hours of, of time on the valve. So Eric said, "We we want to keep we want to inspect these valves." Closely and make sure that they aren't uh, they aren't deteriorating. Uh, another area of concern uh, these engines when they get high time is the the cam and lifter interface, which have a history of of spalling um, if corrosion occurs. And generally, uh, this is a problem that occurs in airplanes that that are used irregularly and that that sit around. And since uh, unruly Skyhawk was flying its pants off. Um, Eric uh, uh, felt pretty confident that this wasn't going to be a problem with this particular engine, although it is a big problem with a lot of engines of owner flown airplanes um, because they, they they don't fly regularly enough. But this airplane was flying quite regularly. Eric did suggest that the um, that the club switch from using Aeroshell 15W50, which is what they had been using in the engine. To using a Phillips XC 20W50 and adding a cam guard um, for improved uh, protection against corrosion and wear, and to try to keep the inside of the engine a little bit cleaner. Um, a third vulnerability uh, that Eric brought out is is sticking valves. Uh, it's a long-standing problem with Lycoming engines, and Eric recommended um, <clears throat> that in order to prevent uh, valve sticking from happening. Uh, the the engine should undergo a, a valve wobble test every 400 hours or so uh, in accordance with uh, Lycoming Mandatory Service Bulletin 388C, which uh, which tells you how to do that. And it basically involves uh, taking the, the, the rockers and the valve springs off and, and using a fixture with a dial indicator to measure how much wobble the, the valve has in the guide. And um, if it has too much wobble, then then the guide is excessively worn. And if it has too little wobble, then the um, the then the the guide is getting um, um, deposits build up in it that, that can ultimately lead to valve sticking. And so the the valves want to uh, want to have wiggle in the acceptable range. And if they if if uh, 
if they don't have enough wiggle to them, then uh, there's a procedure for dropping the valve into the cylinder, reaming out the guide to clean out the deposits and then putting the valve back together. Um, so Eric recommended that the, that, that the club be doing this uh, at least every 400 hours, which, which would probably mean doing it at each annual inspection because they were flying quite a lot. Um, and he also urged that the club members be trained to recognize the symptoms of what we call morning sickness, which is when the engine runs rough when it's first started cold, first flight of the day, and then it smooths out when the, once the engine warms up. Uh, that kind of um, initial roughness when the engine is cold is a, is a, is a warning sign of, of incipient um, uh, valve sticking. And uh, so Eric wanted to make sure that all of the members of the club were trained to recognize this and to report it uh, to WIT if, if it happened uh, so that they could take remedial action. <clears throat> so anyway, um, the, the first event of significance that happened um, uh, after uh, Eric started working with WIT on this project uh, occurred in uh, when the 2020, uh, the 2012 annual inspection came along, which was the first one that uh, that Witt and Eric were going to be involved in. Um, it started on the 30th of January. Engine time at this point had was up to about 2,500 hours. <clears throat> um, it 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 started a little bit weird because Midwest Air was not used to the protocol that, that that we impose on shops when we work with them that uh, that we wanted them to complete the inspection part of the inspection but not do any repairs or order any parts until they put together a detailed uh, discrepancy list with recommended repairs and and uh, cost estimates for each one and then um, then then gave the owners uh, in this case wit representing the club, the opportunity to, to go through all of the uh, the discrepancies and the cost estimates and and individually approve or decline each one. <clears throat> but um, the, the director of maintenance at Midwest Air was once he understood the procedure that we wanted him to follow, he was he was good with it and uh, he got on board with it fairly quickly. And Eric found that Midwest inspections were thorough and their estimates were fair and their shop rates were reasonable and they basically they were a shop that we could we, we could do business with um what made a point of being present down at the shop when they did the compression test and bore scope inspection on the engine um, and he reported that the compression test went very smoothly with all the cylinders uh, in the 70s which is kind of nice given that the engine was uh, at 2,500 hours. But he said the bore scope inspection was a big disappointment to him because, you know, as he had warned uh, Midwest's bore scope, uh, which was a snap on BK 5,500, which they didn't use very often, um, it was pretty much of a joke. It, it has poor lighting and very poor resolution and, and they can't really see very much. So Witt said, you know, I think I think I, I I better buy the shop a decent borescope so that we can uh, that we can get decent pictures and see what's going on inside the cylinders. And Eric agreed and recommended the the Vividia Able Scope uh, VA 400L from Oasis Scientific, which is the one we like. It's the one I use on my own airplane. Um, cost 250 bucks, so it's not a big deal. And the, and the, the, the newer ones have high definition cameras that just produce the most spellbindingly crisp, beautiful images. It's really, really a great scope for, for, for the money. So at any rate, they, they went ahead and ordered one of those so that they would have a decent bore scope going forward, because that's very important in terms of, uh, of uh, engine condition monitoring. So everything went smoothly for about another two and a half years. Um, and then in, in 2014, um, September 2014, the engine was up to about 3,250 hours. The club organized a spot landing contest and several of the members who participated in it reported that the engine was hiccuping and making loud popping sounds when throttled back for landing. <clears throat> 
when we're doing spot landings. So uh, Witt reported this to, to Eric, asked for advice. Eric said, well, hiccuping and popping is a pretty distinct symptom. It suggests that one cylinder of the engine is intermittently not firing. And when the cylinder doesn't fire, then unburned fuel air uh, comes in the intake valve and goes out the exhaust valve unburned. And then it winds up uh, getting burned in the in the exhaust plumbing when it when it meets the exhaust from the other uh, cylinders, and that causes the popping sound. So he says it's, it's not very likely that it's an ignition problem because for it to be ignition problem, both plugs in the in one cylinder would have to not fire, and that's not a very uh, likely scenario. So he says more likely it's a it's an exhaust valve problem, maybe a sticking exhaust valve. So this would probably be a good time to do the wobble test. <clears throat> um, so the plane was coming up for uh, for a 50 hour oil change, and so asked the shop to do the the wobble test um, while it was in for an oil change. They did the wobble test. Uh, all four exhaust valves actually passed the test with flying colors. They all had wobble right in the acceptable range. But in the course of taking the, the valve train apart to do the wobble test, the shop discovered um, that one of the rocker shaft book bushings in cylinder number two was cracked and broken, which would interfere with the, uh, um, with the ability of that valve to, to operate properly. So they installed a new bushing and put everything back together and lo and behold uh, the hiccuping and popping disappeared and everything was fine so that was 2014 um everything went fine for another uh, couple of years in 2016 um <clears throat> wit came to eric and uh this point the engine's up to 3700 hours um and he says, you know, the engine used eight quarts of oil since the last oil change 35 hours ago. They keep, uh, kept very good track of oil consumption. And uh, and Witt said, I'm, I'm starting to get concerned that the oil consumption is going up. So Eric um, did the math and said, well, that's 4.4 hours per quart. And it's a little bit higher than we would really like to see on a four cylinder Lycoming. It's not high enough to be a problem beyond um, uh, just having to tolerate some oil on the belly. Um, and Eric said, you know, in high time engines like this, um, the oil consumption starting to go up, uh, even though the compressions are still good and so on, is often due to the accumulation of sludge in the oil control rings and the, the, the feed oil feed holes in the piston that feed oil to the oil control ring. And this, when the sludge builds up, it 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 interferes with the um, ability of the of, of the piston to meter oil uh, properly onto the cylinder walls. And Eric said, you know, we have this solvent flush procedure that we we like to use that can sometimes clear uh, sludge out of the oil control ring and the and the, the oil feed holes if it hasn't uh, if it's not so bad that 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 it can't be dislodged. Um, and uh, so it's worth a try, he said, but if, you know, if the sludging is so bad that it can't be uh, cleaned up by the solvent flush, then the only cure is to remove the cylinder and, and uh, pull the rings off the piston, and clean everything up um, uh, manually. But he said, I wouldn't be inclined to be pulling cylinders off this engine unless the oil consumption gets really intolerable and it isn't anywhere near that level yet. So a couple of more months passed and Witt's keeping track of oil consumption. And he says, well, he, he says, now it's up to 3.3 hours per quart. It seems to be getting worse. Eric says, well, this isn't gonna affect power or safety or anything like that, but it is gonna slowly get worse. And eventually when it gets bad enough, you're gonna start having problem with, with fouled spark plugs, particularly bottom spark plugs and it may spook pilots a little bit you may have to do something about it he said right now there's no safety concern but if you want to try that oil ring solvent flush procedure it may help but having things haven't gotten too bad or it might not help but it's worth a try and if 
you want to try it, um, the, the sooner the better, because the, the earlier you do it, the better chance it has of succeeding. So Witt, Witt thought this was a good idea. He said it would certainly make sense to take a $400 gamble on a solvent flush rather than spending $40,000 on an engine overhaul, um, especially given the downtime that the overhaul would cost. Um, so um, uh, Eric had, uh, had Witt print out a copy of the solvent flush procedure, which is on our website. And there's a, there's a, a short URL up there if anybody wants to download it. Uh, but it's just a two page write up that explains <clears throat> how to do the solvent flush procedure. And effectively, it involves filling each cylinder's combustion chamber with, with a, a solvent mixture and then forcing it um, through the ring pack by, by turning the prop and uh, trying to dislodge. Um, the sludge that's that's uh, that that's sludging up the the rings and the oil feed holes. So, um, uh, Witt took this right up uh, to uh, to the shop and came back to Eric and said, "Well, Midwest Air has never done this flush procedure, and they sound like they're a little bit squeamish about doing it. Um, maybe we should fly the plane to a shop that's." That, that, that has some experience doing the procedure. So they decided to take it <clears throat> to fly the plane down to um, uh, Tennessee Aircraft Services, the shop that a colleague of mine, Paul New, who um, is one of the participants in my podcast, uh, operates a shop down there in, um, in Western Tennessee and has done this a whole lot of times. So they, they, they flew the airplane down to Paul's shop. Uh, we, we twisted Paul's arm. Normally his shop's booked up for about a year in advance, but we twisted his arm a little bit. He allowed that he would, uh, he would squeeze him in. Uh, so he flew, flew down there. They went through the procedure. And a couple, couple of days later, Paul reports back and he says, well, we're done with the solvent flush. The front two cylinders cleaned up very nicely, but the rear cylinders wouldn't uh, pass solvent very well, even after multiple attempts. Um, he said, I'm, I'm pretty sure that those two cylinders are responsible for most of the remaining oil consumption. And he says, if the assumption, if the oil consumption becomes intolerable, you, you might want to consider pulling cylinder three first, taking a look at the cam and lifters. If the cam and lifters look okay, you could pull uh, four as well and clean everything up. But if the uh, cam and lifters don't look so good, then you might want to bite the bullet and decide it's time to overhaul. So Witt flew the plane home from Tennessee and reported that uh, on a four hour flight, uh, the engine only used one quart, which was uh, an improvement over what it had been doing before. So the solvent flush did reduce the oil consumption uh, noticeably. Um, and uh, Witt said, well, since we're nowhere close to Lycoming's maximum oil consumption threshold of a quart in two hours, it's not really clear that we need to do anything further at this time. And so they didn't. And they kept flying the airplane and they flew it and they flew it and they flew it. And um, they flew it for about another four and a half years <laughs> until. Uh, 1,200 hours uh, and four and a half years later, it brings it up to 2021 last year. Um, and uh, in June 2021, with the engine at 4,800 hours, what said to Eric, you know, I think we're finally between the proverbial rock and the hard place where we are right now. The engine is burning a quart every three hours. It's getting hard to start, probably because of... Uh, fouled spark plugs. Um, we're having oil fouling problems with the bottom of spark plugs. The cylinder number two compression is starting to go down a little bit. And he says, you know, I really don't think it makes sense to start replacing cylinders on a 4,800 hour engine. So it seems to me that maybe the time has come. And uh, Eric said, you know, I can't disagree. It's, it's uh, 4,800 hours on the engine, it probably doesn't make sense to start taking heroic measures, taking things apart. Um, 
Witt says, you know, our Lycoming factory engine has now served us well for 23 years and 4,800 hours. So the board has decided to replace it with another Lycoming rebuild. Eric says to Witt, I, I, I would suggest that you order it directly from Air Power Inc. in Texas rather than ordering it through uh, the FBO. He says, if you order it through the FBO, they'll, they'll mark it up and they'll charge you sales tax and on a $37,000 engine that, that can wind up being quite a lot of money. This was a little surprising to Witt. He says, doesn't the shop get an FBO discount? And Eric says, no, they'll pay the same price that you would pay, but then they'll mark it up and they'll have to pay sales tax. If you have the engine shipped to you from Texas, um, you, you won't pay any tax. And so, um, any rate, what decides that that's the right thing to do, and with the with the uh, concurrence of the board, they got quotes from Air Power, uh, which is the largest distributor of Lycoming engines, <clears throat> and um, they got a quote for a for a, um, a factory overhauled engine of uh, twenty nine thousand and change, and for a factory rebuilt engine. Um, 33,699 and um, they opted to go for the rebuilt, um, place an order with a deposit with uh, with air power. <clears throat> and now the waiting process for the engine began. Initially air power quoted delivery in 12 weeks, uh, but not long after that they amended the delivery to 14 weeks. Um, as the 14 week date approached, Air Power notified WIT that due to supply chain issues at Lycoming, the delivery date for the engine would be delayed further until late December 2021, which would have been 25 weeks. As December approaches, they uh, said Lycoming had run into additional delays. And by the way, this is not at all unusual. This is what we're seeing right now. The um, Nobody is meeting delivery dates. Everybody's slipping dates. Um, well, when when you, when you get a delivery date from Content, Continental or Lycoming, um, you, you know, double it. <laughs> it's just it's just a horrible time to 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 be uh, uh, trying to order an engine or or get an engine overhauled. It's, it's a very difficult time right now because of all these supply chain issues. So, at any rate, uh, ultimately the uh, the delivery date slipped into February of uh, of this year which uh, wound up being 27 weeks. Um, in the meantime, uh, the old engine, which they'd continued to fly, had reached 5,000 hours, but it was having such a hard time starting and had such bad spark plug fouling issues that ultimately the board of directors of Unruly reluctantly decided that they were gonna ground the airplane until the new engine could be installed. Um, the new engine finally arrived in mid-February. Um, the plane was back in the air on March 10th with a with a fresh factory rebuilt engine, and uh, and they made this old engine made it to TBO 5000. So of course, at this point, we are all dying of curiosity as to what this. 5,000 hour engine, um, it's gonna look like inside. And, you know, unfortunately the, this engine has to go back to Lycoming as a core, um, but Witt persuaded the shop to, to pull uh, number two cylinder and, and piston and connecting rod so that he could look inside and take some photos um, and get an idea of what the bottom end looked like before the uh, engine was returned back to Lycoming for, for core credit. And um, it was quite interesting to see what this engine looked like at 5,000 hours. Uh, the number two piston, you know, predictably had a lot of sludge in, in, the, in the ring pack and, and, and so on. Uh, we knew that that was the case. And that's what uh, accounted for the, for the oil consumption. Um, but the cylinder itself, um, was really in remarkably good shape. It, it still had plenty of crosshatch left, and it, you know, had excellent compression and so on. And 
So really the only problem uh, was the fact that there was a, a lot of, of lead sludge uh, messing up the, 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 the piston ring pack. Um, the inside of the crankcase was just clean as a whistle. These are actual pictures of what this engine looked like um, when, when the cylinder was taken off. Um, the number two um, rod journal, the, the crank pin that the, the big end of the connecting rod uh, connected to um, was in excellent condition. Uh, the big end bearing on that connecting rod had, had some, some wear, as you can see. But it was still in pretty good shape. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't any kind of jeopardy. And the rod bearings uh, typically wear a lot more than the main bearings. They're under a lot more stress. And uh, uh, so, if the rod bearings look okay, then you know you can be sure that the main bearings uh, would have looked excellent. But of course, the only way to look at the main bearings is to split the case. We weren't going to do that. Uh, the cam lobes had some minor wear, but um, but no pitting, uh, corrosion damage, um, no distress that was deep enough to to catch with a with a fingernail. Um, so the cam was in good shape, which we were pretty sure it was going to be because this engine was flying very regularly. Um, the cam and lifter spalling is what if, if uh, one of these engines fails to make TBO, it's usually going to be because the cam and lifter came apart. But uh, that's a common problem with owner flown airplanes that sit around, but it was not going to be a problem with this club airplane that flew a lot. And to be honest, had it not been <clears throat> for the sludged up oil control rings, uh, this engine probably could have gotten another thousand hours with, with, without any problem. There didn't seem to be any real issues with it. And, and actually, had this engine been run on unleaded fuel um, uh, so that the sludge problem, you know, wouldn't have wouldn't have occurred. It'd, it'd probably still be flying. Um, so if you ever wondered why these four-cylinder light combings have a reputation for being bulletproof, um, this is a pretty good indication. So uh, that's the 11-year story of this engine and a couple of key takeaways. You know, not every light combing engine is going to make it to 5,000 hours, um, uh, although a surprising number of them make it to three or 4,000 hours if they're flown regularly and given a chance, particularly if they're like flight school airplanes or flying club airplanes that, that fly regularly. Uh, you know, if you think about it, unruly Skyhawk had an awful lot going for it. it. It flew 300 hours a year. It lived in an area of moderate corrosion risk. It wasn't on the coast or anything like that. It was always hangered. It was always preheated in the wintertime, never cold started. It was uh, meticulously um, maintained. And probably most important, it, uh, it, it was allowed to, uh, uh, to, to reach a ripe old age without being arbitrarily euthanized. Um, now, not every engine is going to make it to 5,000 hours, but it seems to me every engine deserves a chance to continue in service until its time comes, the way this uh, IO360 was allowed to do. Wouldn't it have been a crime to euthanize this engine at 2,000 hours when it hit TBO, uh, when, when it had another 3,000 hours of, of useful service in it? Of course, you know, when, when Whit came to us and Eric got involved, there was no, we, we had no idea that this engine was going to make it to 5,000 hours. Um, and we weren't going to try to guess uh, how, you know, how, how far it was going to go. Uh, we just wanted to make sure that we were keeping track of, of things and doing uh, responsible condition monitoring, um, bore scoping, uh, you know, doing wobble tests, uh, checking the filter and all that kind of stuff. Uh, because the engine will uh, will always start talking to you as the time approaches. You just have to be sure you're listening. Uh, um, by extending the engine's life from 2,000 to 5,000 hours, the Flying Club saved itself at least $60,000 from what they would have spent if they had been replacing the engine each time it reached TBO. Uh, and, it, and they also saved themselves a huge amount of downtime. Um, that, that would have been incurred um, replacing the engine when it really didn't need to be replaced. So at any rate, um, that's, the, that's the story of the unruly Skyhawk that made it to TBO 5000. Uh, and um, it's, this, is, this is a success story. This is what, the kind of thing we like to see. Um, I think the club 
did everything right and they definitely got their money's worth out of this engine and with that uh sam i'd be happy to uh, uh to entertain any questions that, that might have come up okay mike thank you very much we do have several questions that have come in already let's start with josh's he's wondering does the club take on any additional liability by overflying the tbo time well you know that's that's not a mechanic question that's a lawyer question um the the um certainly the the, the club was not in jeopardy as far as its insurance was concerned or anything like that everybody knows that that um that that the part 91 operators are are not obligated to um to follow uh, manufacturers uh uh, TBO recommendations. Um, it, you know, if 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 the airplane crashed and and it got in, it got in got a lawsuit involved, you you never can really predict what's going to happen there. Um, but uh, that that was just a decision that the uh, that that the the club members and the, and the board um, had to make. Um, there, there, you know, I, I've, I've dealt with a number of flying clubs. Some of them are very, very conservative with this in, in this regard, and they, they, they observe manufacturers' TBOs whether they need to or not um, because of concern about liability. I mean, I personally think that there's that there's way too much concern about liability in aviation and that it causes us to do a lot of stupid things um it seems to me that that the, the way you deal with liability is to is is to have good insurance um rather than try to 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 avoid the liability in the first place but that's that's just you know my philosophy and it's the way i've operated my business over the years and uh, it's stood me in good stead um knock on wood we 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 never had a lawsuit <laughs> we carry plenty of insurance and we try to do the right thing samuel was wondering what's a good rule of thumb for an engine being quote unquote flowing often enough is it 50 hours a year 100 hours a year 300 hours a year well you, you know you can't really go by hours a year because it's 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 not the amount that it's flown, it's the amount that it's not flown. <laughs> it's the, it, you know, you, you could have an airplane conceivably that flew 300 hours a year, um, but only during during the, the, the spring and summer months. And then, and then you know, if, if it was a high, highly seasonal operation, it, it, it could be vulnerable. Um, the, 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 um, the the real killer of engines is are periods when it's not used, and um, you know if you think about it, we don't usually have this problem with our automobiles because it's it's very unusual to to go a week without driving your car, but it's not unusual to go a week without flying uh, airplanes. Now that again that wasn't true of the club airplane because they had 14 people sharing the Skyhawk, and so it. it Blue very regularly, but um, it, it's really a, 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 a question of disuse. And for owner flown airplanes, of course, disuse is just a fact of life. And but we and we have to take remedial steps to try to minimize the risk to the uh, to the engine, to, to the aircraft in general, but to the engine in particular when the airplane's not flying. So um, things like hangering, uh, things like uh, using a um, uh, an, an engine dehumidifier, um, things like using additives like CamGuard, which are, is pretty effective at, at uh, um, uh, reducing um, uh, corrosion risk. Um, all those sorts of things are are important to try to minimize the uh, the likelihood that you're going to have uh, uh, corrosion damage uh, internally to the engine during periods of disuse. But of course, the best thing you can do is is fly the airplane every week, every two weeks at most, if you possibly can. If you can't, then 
then there are things you can do. If you have a high, highly seasonal operation, if you're up in Alaska and you can't fly during the winter, um, you can you can pickle the engine and preserve it that way. There, there's there's always things you can do to to try to protect it against corrosion damage during uh, periods of time when it's not flying. But the ideal scenario is for it to fly uh, fly very regularly. And the club airplane and flight, flight school airplanes and things like that um, do the best in that regard. That's why. You know, with with flying club and flight school airplanes, it's we we frequently will see these engines go to 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 double or more of published TBL. It's less common that that happens with with uh, single owner airplanes because they just don't fly as regularly. George was wondering if you could give a quick explanation of the difference between an overhauled and a rebuilt and an air power new engine. <clears throat> um, okay, well, the, 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 an overhaul is, it, it, it's a little bit confusing with Lycoming because Lycoming um, actually offers, at least, at least I know they did offer, whether they still offer or not, I don't know, but, um, but, but they offered factory overhaul engines. Um, uh, a an over an overhauled engine most of the time overhauled engines are, are are done by an engine shop in the field somewhere rather than by the factory and an overhauled engines by regulation only needs to be overhauled to service limits um but um but but any self-respecting top of the line engine shop is always going to do the overhaul to to, to new limits um, the um, uh, rebuilt engines or new engines can only come from the factory uh, a, a, a field shop cannot rebuild an engine uh, rebuilt implies that the factory did it and for all intents and purposes there really isn't any significant difference between a, a rebuilt engine and a new engine, except usually the new engine has a little longer warranty. Um, technically, a rebuilt engine is allowed to use, uh, it, it, it has to meet new fits and limits, but it is allowed to use um, parts that have approved undersize or oversized dimensions. So, for example, um, a rebuilt engine can have a crankshaft that 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 has been reworked and reused, whereas a new engine has to have a brand new crankshaft. Um, you know, th there's actually some argument to be made for for a a, a reused crankshaft being uh, less vulnerable to infant mortality failures than than a new one because it's a known quantity. Um, we we Back in 2000, we had a rash of, of, of crankshaft failures uh, due to metallurgy problems in, in new crankshafts um, um, that only happened with, with, with new ones, didn't happen with, with reused ones. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, for, for all intents and purposes, a rebuilt engine and a new engine um, are, are equivalent uh, with the exception of um, uh, of the fact that new engines typically have a somewhat longer warranty. Jeremy says, my mechanic claims if we go too far over TBO, the core value drops so much that it's not worth it. Is there any truth to that? Really not. Um, for, first of all, it, well, it depends on what you what 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 you're doing. If if you're exchanging the engine for for a rebuilt engine. Uh, the factory will pretty much take any hunk of junk back as a core. Uh, be, you know, they 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 really don't care what the condition of the of, of the engine is. And in fact, when it's time to to do an engine, frequently the decision as to whether to do a field overhaul or to exchange it for a factory engine will have to do with the condition of the core. If 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 the engine has 
some known problem with it that would in, that would involve a major upcharge if if it if it went to an engine shop for an overhaul let's say it's got a bad case half um, or a uh, you know, something like that, that where, where, where the overhaul would be unusually expensive, then frequently the, the best thing to do is to, is to trade the engine in for a, for a factory engine because the factory will pretty much take anything um, in exchange. Theoretically, the, the core has to have a serviceable case and a serviceable crank, but in, in real life, the, the, the factory almost never fails to give full core credit. Um, uh, to to whatever you send back to them. Um, so it it you know it's really it's the, the the notion that going over TBO makes the you know will will we'll create problems when it's time to 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 overhaul the engine really doesn't have much truth to it at all. It's it's a it's a common thing that that that, that I hear mechanics say, but but in in real life it really doesn't make any difference you know i i i took the right engine on my cessna 310 to what is it 230 percent of tbo and then had it field overall and engine was fine and nobody complained about it <laughs> it's just you know there really isn't anything to it Paul was wondering, do carbureted engines last longer than fuel injected engines if operated in a similar manner? No, not particularly. No reason, no reason that that would be the case. And uh, John was just wondering, how many hours are new or overhauled engines run on the test stand? <clears throat> not very long. Um, I I'm trying to remember because I, I uh, I, I've visited the Continental factory probably half a dozen times. Um, I've only been to the Lycoming factory once that I recall to in, in Williamsport. But um, if, if I had to make a wild guess, I would say they probably aren't run on the test stand for more than about 90 minutes. Walt wonders, does running an engine on unleaded fuel reduce the existing lead-based sludge? No, it just prevents the additional buildup of it. Um, the, 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 sludge, the sludge is um, very nasty stuff, and, it, and it, it's very difficult to dislodge. You know, we, we have this solvent sl uh, flush procedure, but it's a little bit of a misnomer because it's there, there really isn't any solvent that will dissolve that stuff. What, what, when we do that solvent flush, we're not really trying to dissolve the sludge because you can't do that. What we're trying to do is is mechanically force it out by by pushing fluid th through the, the the ring pack and the and the oil feed holes under as much pressure as we can. Um, so maybe you, you fill up the combustion chamber with with fluid, and you, you put the spark plugs back in, and then you pull the prop, um, and and it's typically starts off very very stiff, very hard to pull through, and you keep repeating the procedure, and and if 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 you're successful, then each time you pull the prop through, it gets easier to pull, and you can hear the fluid squirting out through the the oil feed holes, but if it's real stubborn. Uh, you, you may not be able to dislodge it. It's really not something that can be dissolved. It, it, it has to be removed mechanically, and that's the solvent flush, flush procedure attempts to remove it mechanically without having to pull the cylinder off. Um, and you know, like I say, it, sometimes it works, uh, but, but if it's sludged up too badly, it, it may not work. And in the case of of the uh, unruly engine. It was pretty common. It, it it worked okay on two cylinders, and two cylinders were just sludged up too badly to to dislodge, and that's that's not unusual. Dale says Slick Fifty has served me well in automobiles. Is there any consideration for aircraft? Um, I'm trying to remember what what the ingredients in Slick Fifty are. Um, but if they, uh, 
uh, I, I'm, I can't recall whether Slick 50 is one of those things that has additives that has PTFE in it, which is the chemical formula for Teflon. But uh, if, if it does, that uh, Teflon containing or PTFE containing additives are definitely not recommended in aircraft engines because they have the potential for um, uh, for for messing up uh, hydraulic lifters. Uh, I, I would have to go pull an MDS an MSDS sheet on P, on uh, Slick 50 to figure out what's in it. I haven't looked at it in a long time. Danny says, are there any limits on the number of times an overhaul should be done on the same engine? Um, well, <clears throat> I'll, I'll say a qualified no. Um, when when a when an engine is overhauled, the crankcase halves um, are uh, are are the the, uh, the mating surfaces are are ground flat so that they that that that, that they have a, a good oil tight fit together, and then the case half is is a line board to to bring the uh, the, the you know the bearing. Um, saddles back into proper dimension, and there's there's only a certain amount of metal that you can take off the case and have it still qualify. Normally, you know, a, a case can go through that procedure, you know, half a dozen times at least be, before it, it runs into any trouble. And it, it really depends on how much metal they have to take off to 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 make the mating surfaces uh, flat again. Um, Crankshafts themselves, uh, Lycoming had a white paper out uh, a, a while back that um, has, has disappeared off their website, unfortunately. But it did talk about what the service life of a crankshaft is. And it indicated that the average life of a Lycoming crankshaft was about 14,000 hours, which is uh, Probably longer than most of us will will wind up flying in our lifetime, um, and it, it sort of indicated that the crank can go 7,000 hours or so before it flunks dimensional checks, and when it flunks dimensional checks, it can it gets reground to an approved undersized dimension and installed with with um, undersized bearings, and then can go another an, an, another 7,000 hours, and then if it Flunks dimensional checks a second time, uh, then then it's uh, put out to pasture and it's no longer usable. But that's an awfully long lifetime, so that's that's lots of TBOs <laughs> um, before a crankshaft. Uh, obviously, you know, if, if the crankshaft has a prop strike or something like that, it might not last fourteen thousand hours. But assuming nothing untoward happens to it, um, that they have a very long life. Shabazz asks, if you had to make a plan for monitoring engine condition past TBO, how would you go about it? Um, bore scope, oil analysis, would you add any other items in the monitoring plan? Well, certainly oil filter inspection and in the case of Lycoming, suction screen inspections are very important. They're, they're a lot more important, I think, than oil analysis is um, because oil analysis only tells you about microscopic wear metals that are floating around, but anything of, of any significant size is going to get caught in the oil filter and is not going to make it into the sample jar. So if something is coming apart seriously in the engine, like let, let's say the cam and lifters are coming apart, which is a very common reason that engines wind up having to be taken out of service, that almost never shows up in oil analysis because the metal that's coming off the cam and lifters are of sufficient size that they're always going to get caught in the oil filter and they'll never wind up in, in the oil sample. Um, so uh, oil analysis is good for very, very slow wear events, things like uh, if you have accelerated wear of uh, exhaust valve guides or something like that that are made of very, very hard material and that wear very slowly, that's the sort of thing that will show up in oil analysis. Uh, another thing oil analysis is great for is, is uh, looking for silicon in the oil that, that indicates that dirt's getting into the engine. There's some problem with the uh, 
with the um, induction air filter or the or the uh, alternate air door or carburetor heat door or something that's allowing uh, dirt to get into the engine. So oil analysis is very useful, but but it's it's in a supporting role. The most important way that we monitor low bottom end condition is by inspecting the oil filter and the suction screen. And the best way we have of monitoring top end condition is with a bore scope. So if you do uh, all of those things, um, you're going to have a really good idea what's going on. Lawrence is wondering, have you heard of an 0540 making it long past TBO? I've heard they're a little different due to the large counterweights on the crankshaft. <clears throat> um, I, I've certainly heard of of 540s going well past TBO. I, I don't think I've ever heard of one making four or 5,000 hours. The the ones that tend to make four or 5,000 hours are, are the, the little four cylinder ones. Um, but, um, but they're, but they're very solid engines. The bottom ends of these engines are, um, are, are very, very robust as, as long as they don't have some kind of a lubrication failure. Um, uh, the bottom ends uh, can last a very, very, very long time. The, um, uh, the 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 biggest problem we have with these these engines have to do with all of the stuff having to do with the valves, frankly. Um, um, burn valves, particularly in Continentals, sticking valves, particularly in Lycomings, and cam and lifter issues. In in Continentals, uh, lifters can be replaced easily. Uh, camshafts obviously require teardown. In light combings, uh, both lifters and camshafts require a teardown because light combing use uh, light combings use uh, mushroom style lifters that can't be removed from the outside of the engine. George wonders what has the worst rate of failure: a field overhaul or a factory rebuild? Oh, I don't know that there's any way of 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 of, uh, of commenting on that. Uh, you know, I think field overhauls um, depend on who's doing the overhaul. Uh, I I think a really top-notch field overhaul shop uh, arguably could build a better engine than the factory does, uh, but but there are all sorts of overhauls and all sorts of overhaul shops and and so there's a pretty wide wide range um th there are some advantages that the factory has um <clears throat> uh because they are, are more of a production line operation than than the, than the typical field um, overhaul shop and so for example when I watch them build engines at the Continental uh, factory, they they don't use the kind of torque wrenches that that, that you and I are used to, where you you dial in a particular torque that that you're looking for. Uh, every one of their torque wrenches is a is a purpose built wrench that is fixed to the particular torque and not adjustable, so it's impossible to, uh, to for, for the mechanic to make an error and get the wrong torque. So there's some some advantages to the production line environment that the um, uh, that that the factories have, uh, and on the other hand, um, uh, I, you know, really good field overhaul shops. Uh, there's more craftsmanship really that goes into the engine. So there's 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 pros and cons. Um, a really good field shop build will build an excellent engine, and the factory generally builds a builds a pretty good engine. So. Several people are wondering about the solvent flush and if it's worthwhile to do it on a regular basis or said another way, is there any downside to doing it on a regular basis? I don't think there's any downside to doing it. And I think that, you know, there might be a reasonable argument for, you know, for doing it prophylactically at, you know, every thousand hours or something like that. It's it's not hard to do, and it's completely non-invasive. I mean, it's, you don't take anything apart to do it, which is really a nice thing. Uh, obviously, you want to do it uh, at, when you're doing an oil change because um, when you're doing the solvent flush, you're 
either the, the, the last thing you do is you is, is you service the engine with fresh oil and, and, and because the solvent flush has, has stripped off the oil film from inside the cylinders, you, you, you need to go in and, and pre-lube the cylinders with a, uh, with, with the, with a spray can um, to, so, so that the, the rings won't squeak against the, the cylinder walls when, when you first turn the engine over. Um, but it's, it's not a hard thing to do. Um, and it, it typically would add a couple hours of labor to a to, a, to an oil change. Uh, some mechanics um, are a little squeamish about doing it only because it's you know it's not it's it's not in the in the Continental or Lycoming manual and they they don't want to do something that they that the manufacturer doesn't explicitly uh, uh, call for. Um, some mechanics are fine with it. It's in my mind, it's you know, it, it's there's no downside to doing it, and because I don't like pulling cylinders, if if there's a way to remediate a problem without pulling cylinders, it's worth a try. I feel the same way about you know lapping exhaust valves. You know, the standard way of dealing with a with a leaky exhaust valve is to pull a cylinder off, but I don't like pulling cylinders off. That, that's very invasive, and and there's some risk involved in doing it. So I'd rather try the, the non-invasive way first. And if it works, great. If it doesn't work, you always have the option of pulling the cylinder. That was the, you know, kind of the decision that, that the unruly guys went through. They, they tried the non-invasive thing. It, it, it helped some, it didn't totally cure the problem, but it bought them several more years of, 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 of flying. And then finally, when they got to the point where the only way they could continue is to start pulling cylinders off the engine. And he said, hey, the engine's at 4,800 hours. It doesn't really make sense to start pulling cylinders off a 4,800 hour engine. They decided, I think prudently that, that, you know, the engine was telling them that it was time. George is wondering, can an aircraft owner pilot do a solvent flush as preventive maintenance? You know, to be honest with you, I don't see why not. <laughs> It, it, like I say, it's totally non-invasive, uh, and and uh, especially um, you know, given the FAA's legal decisions that, that that make it clear that it's you know that that it's not only the items in in Part 43 uh, uh, Appendix A sub C that we're allowed to do as preventive maintenance. I don't see any reason why an aircraft owner couldn't do a solvent flush. He's allowed to pull spark plugs. He's allowed to change oil. There's nothing about the solvent flush that's, that's any more involved than that. Chris I, was I, would, I would, by the way, and, and we have this in the instructions, but um, uh, I, I, if, you, if the airplane has a, an oil quick drain, I would remove it before doing the solvent flush, just because the the solvent might, you know, might attack the the O rings in the quick drain and and cause it to leak if the quick drain is exposed to solvent. So, I, I would typically take the quick drain off of the engine before doing a solvent flush. But Paul was wondering, is there any differences to the break in of a fuel injected engine over a carbureted engine? Nope. No difference whatsoever. And Chris is wondering, um, are fouled oil control rings a symptom of a more significant problem? Maybe clogged oil distribution or oil pump issues? No, not at all. It, it's it, it's it's just characteristic of the fact that that um, that we're, we're using leaded fuel, and um, the the um, Compression rings uh, don't seal perfectly, and so a certain amount of of um, residual stuff gets by the compression rings and 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 gets into the oil control rings. And um, lead, uh, when it mixes with oil, uh, creates this kind of nasty sludge. Uh, it's the kind of thing that 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 affects higher time engines because because the the, the higher time engines does tend to blow a little bit more 
stuff by the compression rings. It also tends to affect um, engines that have a, a small oil sump capacity for the, their displacement. For example, the, the engines in the Cirrus SR22 or the, uh, the Columbia's um, have large displacement engines, IO550 engines, um, but, but they have a, a very small oil sump. It's an eight quart sump and nobody runs them more than about six quarts because it, they'll kick anything above six quarts out the breather. So you're asking a small amount of oil to absorb a, a, a large amount of blow blood and that's kind of a, a prescription for sledging issues. Roger was wondering if you could put that URL up for the flush procedure again. Well, I might be able to find it. Let's see here. I think Talk you had like a yourselves. tiny, like a tiny URL or something. I think you had, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had a short one, but let me find it. It's right here. How about that? Nice. Wow. <laughs> yeah, it just it just popped up with that page. No flipping through the slides or anything. Good job. So yeah, it's a, it's just a two page write up, um, and it's a pretty straightforward procedure. William says I was told to use Avgas to flush the engine and clean sludge. Have you seen this? And does it work? Don't smoke. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you, like I said, you know, to be honest with you, um, it's not that critical what fluid you use for this procedure because we're really not trying to dissolve the stuff. We're trying to mechanically force it out. Um, so, you know, any, any, uh, any fluid that, that is compatible with, with, uh, with engine uh, components is is okay. I I wouldn't use anything like super aggressive. The this the 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 witch's brew that is recommended in in our write up is is largely varsol, which is basically paint thinner um, mixed with uh, with some engine oil. Um, but uh, uh, you know, if if you wanted to use Avgas mixed with engine oil, and you, I, I I just worry about it because of the fire hazard, because Avgas is so much more um, volatile than than, uh, than paint thinner is. But uh, it's it's it to be honest with you, it's not super critical what fluid you use for this procedure. Catherine was wondering if taking a constant speed prop past TBO, what sign should we be looking for that it's getting close to needing an overhaul? Well, you know, again, don't, if, if you ask a prop guy, he'll give you a different answer. <laughs> but but my answer is uh, if, if the prop isn't leaking and it's not having any problem with, with uh, RPM regulation, um, I'm content keeping it in service. You know, I've been, I, I'm, I'm a, a, an NTSB accident report junkie. I, I, I probably read 30 NTSB accident reports a month uh, on general aviation. And I've been doing it for about 50 years now. And, and I have yet to see uh, a general aviation accident caused by a, uh, an over TBO prop, it, it's, it just doesn't happen. Um, the things are, are, are very, very reliable. Uh, so like I say, if the, the, if the prop isn't, isn't throwing oil or grease, and if it's, uh, if it's, if the RPM is regulating properly and you're not, you're not getting RPM wavering around stuff like that, I, I, I'm perfectly comfortable keeping the prop in service myself. Not everybody would agree with that, but that's sort of my approach to it. Bobby wonders, does the amount of calendar time since last overhaul really matter? For example, a Lycoming IO360 last overhauled in 1987 with 1,500 hours since the overhaul. It's flown often two or three times per week. 
over the past few years, but had several years of 10 hours or less flying time. Well, uh, again, it's <clears throat> it, the real concern is corrosion. Um, but, you know, if, if you had a long period of disuse and then the airplane went back into service and you made it through a hundred hours of, of actively flying the airplane and, and, and it's still not making metal, that, then, then I think it's a reasonable thing to assume that you dodged the bullet and you didn't develop any major corrosion problems. If the, you know, if the, if the cam and lifters are going to come apart because of corrosion pitting, they're usually going to come apart reasonably quickly and so in, in my view if, if 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 you've taken the thing out of its inactive state and you've flown it for 100 hours and it's still not making metal you're probably fine thomas was wondering are there periodic tests like the wobble test for big bore continentals um continental doesn't really have an equivalent to the wobble test um uh, Sticking valves is are very very rare in continentals. They're much more of a lycoming problem. Continentals tend to burn valves a lot more, and lycomings tend to stick the valves a lot more. So um, there there really isn't isn't an equivalent uh, to the wobble test for continentals, and there's really not that much need for it. Um, also, I I um, as I described in, in an earlier webinar, um, the, having a, a good a good fit between the the valves, the exhaust valve stem, and the exhaust valve guide is more important, much more important in lycomings than it is in continentals because lycoming valves, because they're sodium filled valves, um, depend on shedding a lot of the heat from the from the valve through the uh, through the stem to guide interface, whereas continentals, uh, almost all of the, the heat is 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 shed between the face of the valve and the seat, and very little through the through the stem. So continentals can get away with pretty sloppy guides. Lycomings have a lot more trouble if the if the guides get get real sloppy. Jorgen wonders about using um, Philips 20W50 with cam guard, or should I use AeroShell W180 plus? Uh, is it as good or better? Well, I, I mean, it sort of depends. Uh, the the we recommended the um, the, the Philips 20W50 uh, to to uh, unruly because of where they lived and the fact that they have cold winters and needed a multi-grade oil. Um, I, you know, I'm based in California. I, I use air shell W100 in my airplane with, with cam guard added um, because I don't do a lot of cold weather flying and, and I prefer a single weight oil unless you need a multi-grade oil because of, uh, because of cold weather. Um, th there, if you're going to use cam guard, there's no reason to use Aeroshell uh, W plus oil. You can just use the regular Aeroshell W oil um, because the, the the cam guard has the the, the friction modifiers and the anti corrosion additives and and so on. So there's no real need to use the plus if you're using cam guard. If you're not using cam guard, then plus is 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 good stuff to use. Lawrence wonders, is an oil breather a good idea to prevent oil blow-by and a dirty underbelly? I'm, I'm not sure he asked that question right, because every engine has has a breather. Every engine needs a breather. Um, was he talking about an oil separator, maybe? Could be. Uh, I recommend against using aftermarket oil separators, um, because they they really aren't they're called air oil separators but they really aren't they're 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 gas liquid separators and, and they they basically centrifugally separate liquids out of the breather effluent and 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 pipe the liquids back into the crankcase and the problem is that the the stuff that comes out the breather it, it has a fair amount of oil in it but it also has 
moisture in it, it has acids in it and the stuff that you really don't want to put back in the crankcase. Um, so um, um, I personally recommend against using aftermarket air oil separators. Um, And Wayne is wondering, in your experience, what's been a major cause of engine failure and infant mortality after an overhaul? Well, I mean, the, the, the short answer to that is it's, it's either a bad part or an assembly error. Um, and uh, I mean, I've seen engines come apart because because a, a, a rod bolt wasn't wasn't properly torqued the, the rod bolts which are the things that hold the, the connecting rod caps onto the body of the connecting rod are the highest stress fasteners in, in the engines and they're torquing them correctly and so on is extremely critical um, but i've also seen catastrophic engine failures caused by um, but by a, a defective parts. Um, we, like I said, in the 2000 era, we had a whole bunch of crankshafts fail because of a metallurgical problem that wasn't detected at the factory. And that happened to both Continental engines and Lycoming engines. Um, I, you know, I, I had a, a, I'll say, I'll say a partial engine failure, uh, something that, that prompted an engine shutdown uh, in my 310 caused by a, a, a piston coming apart. And uh, we sent the failed piston back to the manufacturer and they inspected it under the microscope and determined that there was a, an inclusion in the casting, a little air bubble that caused the, the, the piece of the piston to break off. So stuff like that can happen. Well, Mike, looks like we're getting to the end here. So um, let's wrap it up. Looks like we had uh, just under 600 people tune in tonight and uh, a lot of great questions. I'm sorry we didn't get to all of them um, tonight. Uh, Mike, take a moment and share closing thoughts with everybody. Sure, you bet. Um, well, if, if if you'd like to get on my mailing list for, for the newsletter that we send out um, once a month and uh, maintenance stories that we send out every week or two. Uh, easy way to do that is to, uh, is to text the word SAVVY, S-A-V-V-Y, to the, 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 the short code 33777 on your phone. And a little a mail bot will ask you for your email address and it'll add us to the list. Or you can sign up at, at the, uh, the website SAVVYAVH.com or, or uh, if you take uh, the post webinar survey that Tim's going to put up. There's a little checkbox if you want to get on the mailing list. Um, books are available at Amazon, Aircraft Spruce, EAA Bookstore, um, and our podcast that I do with uh, with Paul and Colleen every month, uh, Ask the A and P Podcast, uh, is available. Spotify or Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. We're going to be doing, um, <laughs> at least we're going to be trying to do a live version of the podcast at uh, at AirVenture this year. This is going to be a great adventure because we've never done it before. I hope we don't embarrass ourselves too badly, but but uh, Paul, Colleen, and I are, are, are going to be doing the podcast on Tuesday morning at, uh, at AirVenture. So if you're going to be there, we Love to have you come armed with questions. Um, podcast is a call-in show. And so if you have a question you'd like to participate in, in our podcast, um, you send your questions to our producer, Ian Twombly, at podcasts at aopa.org. Um, uh, if it's a worthy question, he'll invite you to our recording session. We usually record these things about the middle of each month and then they go through all of the editing and sweetening and stuff like that, and they uh, they go live the first of the first of the next month. Um, and finally, the the next three uh, webinars um, on uh, Wednesday, August third, if I've sufficiently recovered from AirVenture by then, uh, is uh, 
the webinar is called Annual Disaster, and it'll talk about a, an annual inspection that went horribly wrong and uh, try to talk about what lessons can be learned to prevent your annual from going that way. Uh, in September, I'm doing a webinar called What Price Speed, where we're going to be talking about um, uh, about how to optimize your flying to to get the, the 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 best bang for the buck out of your very expensive avgas and so on. And finally, the October webinar, which is titled "On a Short Leash," is uh, we're talking about how you can work with your shop to try to keep um, your your maintenance bills um, from from getting out of control. <laughs> and uh, so that's about all I have, Tim. Well, great, Mike. Look and, forward to uh, seeing everybody at uh, at AirVenture. Yeah, we got 18 days till uh, till we start. And uh, I was just wondering, I I imagine that you're going to be doing your normal uh, dozen or so live forum presentations. Yeah, throughout I've, the week. I've, I've got a dozen presentations, and and this year I'm actually going to be doing four of them. Uh, with Paul and Colleen, we're going to be, it's going to be a little bit different. And uh, the, these four are, we're going to be doing uh, kind of some, some improvisational role playing where, where Paul will play the A&P mechanic, Colleen will play the aircraft owner and I'll, I'll play the, the narrator and, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about bad things that happen to aircraft owners and, 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 and what we can do to, to, to help prevent those things from happening and so on. It's, it, it, hopefully it will be fun if it, if it, if it goes right. So. <laughs> yeah, that sounds like it'll be a fun time. So everybody yeah, can find so. those uh, presentations at EIA.org and uh, go to your venture and then the schedule. Yeah. Um, if you put Mike Bush screen. in there, you'll get 12 or 13 things will pop up. Yeah, yeah. And your um Ask the AMPs podcast, is that like in the AOPA exhibit booth or it it is in the uh, in the AOPA uh, uh by the AOPA tent they have a, okay. they have a little thing. Everything else is gonna be on the forums plaza. Gotcha. Most, mostly in forum seven. Gotcha. But, uh, yeah, the, the, the podcast is gonna be over at the AOPA tent. Well, I sure hope you have safe travels out here to Oshkosh, and uh, hopefully I'll get a chance uh, to be able to see you here at Oshkosh. And uh, thank you so much, Mike. Uh, just yeah, to... could 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 you work on the weather for us a little bit? Hey, we had a that? beautiful day in Oshkosh, and I'm I'm putting my order in to have one just like today. It was uh, low 70s, uh, low humidity, light wind. Uh, partly cloudy, partly sunny. Take your pick, um, boy. A week's worth of weather like this is what yeah. I put my. I kind of, I kind of always hope for really horrible weather the week right before the show, which usually means some big front's going to come through and clear it all out by the time the show starts. <laughs> Whatever it takes to have good weather, yeah. That's right. You bet. Uh, well, we'll see you here then. Everybody who is uh, tuned in tonight, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, if you come to Air Venture. In 18 days, I sure do wish you safe travels and that you have a wonderful time while you're here. Thank you all so much for joining us tonight. Yeah, good night, everybody.